Welcome to the Six Steps to Master the 2023 SATS webinar. It's really lovely here and it's a very, very warm welcome to you all. It's, I don't know if you gathered this, but I am very excited. We are very, very excited and thrilled to have everybody who's come here today and signed up. We had a huge number of signups. So we had about 1800 people sign up for this webinar. And in fact, the first thousand places of the webinar sold out overnight, I think in like two or three hours. So we were kind of really bumped over. Um, we also know that straight after school can be super, super busy. So especially this time of year, so you've got the plays and the nativities, and you've got to find tea towels for hats and angel wings and a million other things to get done at this time of year. So I know that there will be a lot of people out there who will watch this video at a later date. And you guys could too as well, because everybody's going to get a recording. And that's absolutely cool, we totally get it. So I'm Heather and I'm from Learning by Questions and we are hosting this webinar today to celebrate the launch of this year's SATS Springboard. Now that is where we open our doors at Learning by Questions and we let in all the year six teachers who want to come in and use our platform completely. And through our emails and our blogs and our socials, we share as many great tips and tricks from our team, from our thought leaders, from our friends out there like John and Sophie, even math scheme publishers, our friends and partners at White Rose Maths. We all get together and we're doing it just to support you guys because we know what the next few months will feel like for you. Now, I promise I'm not going to just rattle on about learning by questions because I know that many, many of you are here, not to hear from me, but from the incomparable Mrs. B. Sophie, Sophie Bartlett. Um, but I just want to tell you three things about learning by questions you really do need to know because that is going to give you a little bit of context for the springboard. And you're going to hear about it a little bit in the webinar. Um, so it'll just, it'll just give you a bit of context. So learning by questions is a teacher app. Now, please don't groan all at once. I'm looking at how many people are loaded into the webinar and I'm hoping I don't lose anybody here because I know you know You've been sold those silver bullets before and the snake oil and so on. And this really isn't like that. And I'm going to give you three reasons why it's not right. The first one is that we, Learning by Questions, are funded by a charity. We're funded by the Boland Charitable Trust. And the purpose of that charity is to help realize the potential of all pupils and teachers in the classrooms. And there's two reasons why you guys might want to know that. One is that you know our intentions are good and honest and pure. This is not about lining our pockets at all. We are set up and we are funded to support you. And the other thing that's interesting about that is that it means that all of our resources are completely free to use. We do charge a little bit for the delivery platform if you want to use our delivery platform, but that's an optional extra. Our resources, so you can go into our question sets, you can use them front of class, and they are completely free. There's no sneaky premium content. It's all free for you guys to jump in and use. Number two, it's completely unique uh, because when children do use the delivery platform and answer the questions, they're given these personalized and scaffolded feedback. We've thought about the answers as much as we've thought about the questions. And so it works like having a little mini teacher on everybody's shoulder. And that means that you as the teacher, you can get to the children who really do need your support in the mean chair. Now, you're not just, we're not just gonna tell you about this. We're gonna have you experience it later on in the webinar. So make sure that you have maybe another device handy or another window you can open up on your browser. So you can, you can experience it for yourself. And I promise you, you're going to find that it's a game changer. That is the word that we hear the most coming back to us. And the last thing, and this is a real biggie, is that we believe at Learning by Questions that the role of teachers in the classroom is absolutely sacrosanct. There is no app in the world that is going to know these children like you do, and there never will be. So we built Learning by Questions to augment what teachers do and not replace them. So everyone remembers their favorite teacher. Not many people remember their favorite worksheet. So, um, you know, we appreciate that. and We're here to, to, to help you as teachers. Now, you can tell I'm absolutely desperate to show it to you. Um, and if you want to have a go, we're going to do an interactive session at the end of this webinar in about 30 minutes. So like I said, grab another device. Um, so just to reiterate, the, the resources themselves, you can go on, there's no credit card, there's no fee, you don't have to put in an email address, 
you can get in there and you can look at the resources. The only thing you would have to pay for, and we're actually, the SAP Springboard is completely free, so you don't have to pay for it for a whole half a term. And if you like it and you do, then it's two, the most you'll pay is £250 per teacher. And that works out about a pound a day. And you're going to find out just what impact that can make for you for a pound a day. Now, you're going to find out for yourself in a little bit. Let's get on to our guests today, because our guests today are amazing, and I know you're really looking forward to hearing from them. So without further ado, I think some of you might already know her. Sophie, tell us a little about yourself and people who don't already follow you on Twitter. I'll stop. Hi, hello everyone. Um, my name's Sophie. I'm a year five and six teacher. I've taught year five and six for um, just over eight years now. Um, and also a bit of a data geek. So I love numbers, love anything to do with a bit of analysis. Um, you might have seen a bit on Twitter that I've done before. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing a bit more about that with you today. Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, I, you guys are going to absolutely love her analysis. It's coming right up. John is one of my new best friends at Brown Hills West. John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm a um, deputy head teacher at Brown Hills West. Um, I'm also a year six long timer, similar to Sophie. I was in year six for eight years. Um, and I actually introduced the springboard to my um, year six cohort last year. So I'm here to share our, my experience of that and a real success story that hopefully can resonate with a few people today. That's fantastic. I cannot wait for you guys to hear John's story. It is quite incredible. Um, I think we shed a few tears when we heard about it at Learning by Questions Towers. Thanks so much, John, for being here. And also, uh, my partner in crime today is Daryl. He works with me here at LBQ. Daryl, please say hello. Hi, yes. Yeah, so I'm the LBQ Primary Maths Specialist. I've been at LBQ for just over five years now. Before that, I was Maths and Assessment Lead. I was in the classroom for about 10 years mostly in mixed year five, six class. So I've got a bit of experience of what it's like for year six teachers during this time. Uh, and I have also been involved in the marketing of key stage two math sats papers as well. Right, so there you've heard it. Daryl has been there on both sides of the fence, people. So he's a really, really good person to listen to. Okay, so let's get started because there's a lot to get through. Now, tis the season for the trusty crock pot or pressure cooker, depending on uh, the way you see it because we've got six steps or six ingredients, and there's my trusty crock pot, that are the recipe for a successful SATS 2023. Now, ingredient number one, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about that and whiz through it, because ingredient number one is turning this anxiety that we have about SATS into a strategy. And I'm gonna be really honest about that. Um, there's a lot of people learning by questions that are teachers, have been teachers and parent governors. Now, now that's not me. I've been a professional communicator. But when we launched this at Springboard, what I could see was the timings that people were racing onto it. Um, so I could see people logging on for this at four o'clock in the morning, at half past one in the morning, at two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, sometimes teachers say out loud, oh, we're not even going to think about stats until after Christmas. We still don't even talk about it until the other side of Christmas. But what I could see is that in truth, it's keeping people awake at 3 a.m., at 2 a.m., at all hours of the day and night. And that's just not right, okay? We can help you with that. So how do we overcome it? Well, super proud of you guys because you've already made a start. You've decided to come to this webinar because you want to make a plan. You want to do things differently this year. Now, at times of stress, we tend, it's just human nature to go back to we already know, um, you know, better the devil we know, don't take a risk. But you're here because you believe, quite rightly, there is another way of doing this. And there is. And this plan that we're going to put together today, it's based on quality over quantity. The first step is kind of just acknowledging that you're not going to be able to do everything that you want at the detail that you might want to be able to do it. So, Daryl, what are the other gorgeous ingredients that we want to add to our great plan recipe? Yeah, so a few weeks ago, a few of us got together along with Sophie and John's input as well and discussed some of the main things that really make the biggest difference for our year six teachers and pupils. So they're all important considerations and likely to be things that most year six teachers are already doing to some degree, but uh, maybe in different ways. And hopefully what we'll discuss this afternoon will give you a bit more food for thought on how you might do some of them a little bit differently or a little bit more efficiently. So ingredient number two we came up with is a biggie. And I have to admit, this is one that I could probably have done a little bit more of when I was in the classroom. So learning 
uh, learning by looking at patterns from the past. Sometimes it's easy to get very fixated with the present and, and looking ahead to May, of course. Um, but looking at patterns from past papers is so useful. And the information that Sophie is going to share today should give you a solid idea on the topics and skills that hold the most weight and an idea of what the 2023 papers should look like in terms of content domain coverage. Ingredient three, gap analysis. So important, but if we, can't, if we aren't careful, it can take a disproportionately large amount of our time to the detriment of other things. Sophie, again, is going to look at different types of learning gaps. Um, we will also look at LBQ and how, that, how LBQ can help you find the gaps more effectively. Ingredient number four, using targeted revision, along with quality resources, of course, uh, based on people's ex exact gaps, the basis of all good teaching, but how can we do this well for all of the pupils in our class at the same time? With the gaps be being even more varied than ever for this cohort, John will share his experience from last year of how he was able to target his revision to cater for exactly what the pupils needed. Ingredient number five, engagement and assessment without anxiety. Spring term is definitely a long slog for everyone. So how can we engage all pupils in their learning? And again, John will share how the free LBQ resources of part of the SAT springboard play a key part in helping to engage even the most reluctant of learners. And the final ingredient, stretch and challenge. It's important for us to provide stretch and challenge to make sure that more pupils have a chance of achieving that higher standard. And we'll show you the types of challenge that you can expect to find in an LBQ mastery set and let you experience this for yourselves as a pupil. Brilliant, thanks so much, Daryl. So there's probably a lot of things in there that you guys are familiar with, but maybe we're gonna show you how to do those in ways that are brand brand new today. So let's dive into ingredient two, which is why a lot of you have come today, and that's learning from the past. Now, Sophie, it is no surprise, is it, that maybe the first ghost that arrives in Scrooge's Christmas Carol is the ghost of Christmas past. And maybe <laughs> there is some things that we can learn from it. Now, I will just say as a quick disclaimer before we jump into this, that we don't have a crystal ball, do we, Sophie? And Absolutely not. <laughs> we do not know for sure what's going to come up, but we're working smarter, not harder here. So maybe there are some things that we can learn from those past papers. Sophie, take it away. Okay, so since the new curriculum was introduced in 2014, there have been um, five sets of SATs papers since then. And getting my kind of number brain on, um, I think after a couple of years of SATs, I thought I wanted to delve into them really and see what patterns were emerging because as you can see by the numbers and I'll go into them a bit more detail in a moment there are patterns um, over the past five years and I would be surprised if those patterns weren't repeated for the upcoming paper uh, papers so if we look at maths to begin with um, I've broken down all the content domains there from number and place value down to statistics um, and the percent the proportion um, and how those appear across all the SATS papers. And I'm talking about all three, so arithmetic and both reasoning. Um, obviously, arithmetic is mainly for operations and fractions, decimals and percentages, but it carries a great weight when you add up all the marks together. Um, so you can see from um, across all years, actually, that calculations, which is for operations, has been the most common topic. Um, it sort of makes sense, really, because the four operations is needed as a skill in most of the other content domains. So that would make sense. Um, closely followed by fractions, decimals and percentages being the next most common. Um, in fact, the pass mark for all years so far has been always been between 52 and 55%. So bearing in mind uh, this year, just gone 2022, the content of fractions, decimals, percentages and calculations together is 63%. So in theory, this is only theoretically, you could technically pass a SATS paper, mass SATS paper just knowing those two content domains. Now that's not saying let's not cover anything else, but bearing in mind, we know how much as a year six teacher we have to cram in before May. Um, and just thinking strategically, I mean, if we look at position and direction there in 2022, only 2% of the entire maths paper was focused on position and dire direction questions. If we're gonna think cleverly, um, we would, be silly not to focus our revision on those two um those two areas so i think it'd be safe to assume that next year those content domains would appear in similar proportions i'd be really surprised if calculations dropped much at all considering that it does go across all of the other content domains so for maths i'd be looking at focusing on calculations and fdp as we call it and again not saying not to touch on the others but perhaps saving the in-depth teaching of those topics for after sats if you've got to prioritize 
prioritise what to teach and when. Um, so that's the maths papers. If we go on to the grammar, see the maths is a little bit easier to analyse um, than the others. But here we have the content domains of the grammar broken down across the past five sets of papers. So I've put the uh, content domains up the top there from G1 to G7, just because it's much easier than typing it all out. Um, and here we have here the two most common, again, for grammar were G5 and G1 which is grammatical terms or word classes and punctuation. And again, they have consistently been the most common topics since 2016. Um, this year, the 2022 paper, the pass mark for the grammar uh, was just 50%. Um, and so again, if we add together those two content domains, 30% for G5, 24% for G1, that's 54%. So again, theoretically, just by focusing on those two, obviously the children have to get all the questions right for those content domains, I understand that. But just to kind of show you how heavily weighted it is towards those two, you could technically pass a SATS paper knowing those. And I think that has been the case every year since 2017, where the pass marks have been between 51 and 54%, um, that knowing G1 and G5 in depth, you would be able to pass. So again, similar to the maths, it would seem sensible to assume that next year the patterns would be the same. Again, a bit like with the maths, with the four operations it being common sense that that would be popular. Um, same for this, punctuation is, you know, so, so common, especially with writing moderation as well. And grammatical terms and word classes kind of covers all the other bases. So again, if you're going to focus your revision on something or or come up with some kind of strategy of what to teach in your grammar and through your writing, I would focus on those two. If you come to the reading, the reading is the trickiest because it's not black and white with the reading paper, as we all know. Um, there are different co question uh, content domains for the questions, but it's very hard to just teach one question type. And just because you teach inference questions doesn't mean that they get the children they're going to be brilliant at inference questions. I think we all know that by now. Um, however, it's very clear to see, and I'm sure you're all aware that the most common question types in the reading papers has been inference by far, which is a 2D question. Close, well, not even that closely followed. Um, revision, uh, retrieval, sorry, the 2B content domain um, are the two most common question types. Um, and the pass marks have risen from 2016 to 2022 quite considerably. So I'm sure lots of us remember the 2016 paper, which was hideous, and that had a fairly low pass mark of 42%. And since then, it's increased um, to 52%, 56% for two years, and 2022, it was 58%, which is the highest that it's ever been. So looking at that pattern, I think I would expect it to either go up or again, up again, or possibly stay at 58%, maybe drop a little bit. But either way, I doubt it's going to go as low as the low 50s again, which just kind of shows how the high standard they're expecting. Um, the other thing that might be worth noting is I've done there an analysis, the very colourful grid um, is an analysis of the question, the extract types that have been in the papers. So obviously there's three extracts in each reading paper, fiction, non-fiction and poetry. Um, looking back at the past five sets of papers, though, as you can see, clear as day in pink, their poetry has only appeared once so far. Um, so if I did have a crystal ball, I would assume that it might say that poetry could, could all of these weasel words, could come up next year. Um, I am thinking as well, I hate to use the big O word, but Offset do have a focus on poetry at the minute and how poems are being covered across the English curriculum, when and where you're teaching them. So it seems to be sensible, again, to assume that poetry might appear. Again, not saying that it will. Um, it could just be fiction and non-fiction again. But if, if, if it were me, I would be prioritising some poetry coverage in my English lessons. Yeah, so you're a summarize... magic woman. You wouldn't. You would. You might. You might. <laughs> I might. I might. Yeah. All those modal verbs there. Mm -hmm. Um. So to to sort of summarise there, what you would be sensible to focus on at least before May. Um. In maths, I would be focusing on the four operations, so calculations and fractions, decimals and percentages. In grammar, I'd be looking at uh, punctuation and grammatical terms and word classes. And then in reading, as always, covering inference and retrieval questions, but possibly sticking in maybe a bit more poetry than you had planned, unless you had planned loads of poetry anyway. Thanks, Sophie. One of the things that really strikes me about this, and I know you might talk about it a little bit more now, is it's shifting my focus a little bit away from, you know, topic to year group. Yeah. 
Um, it was really interesting, actually, and analysing the maths paper and looking at where the content has come from, from which year groups that it's come from. So, um, again, the grid at the top here, I've looked at the percentage needed of the papers needed to pass or achieve expected standard on each paper. So in 2016, you can see that was 55 percent um, up to 2022, which is 53 percent. If you compare that to the percentage of questions from the SATS papers that come from the years three, four and five curricula, um, quite often it's been higher than the percentage uh, required to pass um, over half. So. Again, in theory, you could not teach any year six content at all. The children could just know the year three, four, five and curricula really, really well and theoretically pass the SATS papers based on the year three, four or five curricula. It does sometimes feel like as a year six teacher, all the onus is on you to pass the SATS, but it's absolutely not the case. And the, well, right down from foundation, you know, the teaching is absolutely important, but you can see here clearly in numbers, that the majority of the questions come from the rest of key stage two. And if anything, that's far more important than the year six content because the year six content sort of tops it up and they need all the children need all the year three, four and five foundational knowledge of maths to be able to even uh, begin to understand the year six um, maths objectives. So um, if you don't mind going on to the next point there, Daryl, sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, so it's worth noting that the 2022 papers, as far as I'm aware, I've looked into it and I'm willing to be corrected if I'm wrong, um, weren't written post COVID. They were supposed to be the 2020 papers. So there weren't any adjustments made because of COVID. This is just a set that was were going to be there and were not. Um, so the fact that the years three to five content was higher than ever before and the past mark remained at 53%, um, you know, just shows how important that that coverage is. Yeah, I think that that's massive. Mm. You know, it blows my mind a little bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, I think I know we're going to talk about this uh, possibly um, soon, but just the, as a year six teacher, you just think how much there is to cram in before May. But if you want to come up with some sort of strategy, it's quite refreshing to know you don't have to cram anything in. It is possible to, you know, have the children do really well on their SATs without covering every single objective and yeah. allowing yourself a bit of time and space to breathe, put some of those objectives after SATs to be able to cover them properly and really focus your teaching and revision prior to May. They're, they're excellent points. And I guess it's one of those things as we explore, we, we almost talk with as many questions as we have answers, because I think the two things that I take from this, Sophie, is the importance of having quality resources for earlier year groups. So you're gonna to yeah. want to be able to put your hands on some great English and maths from year three and year four and year five, as well as your year six material. Absolutely. And having those ready, and you don't wanna be photocopying into the night. You don't want to be looking around for this stuff. You want to have that ready. And then the other thing, of course, Sophie, is this particular cohort, might have missed a lot of year three and four because of COVID. Yeah, I know. I know. I, was, I teach mix five and six together, and I was finding that I'm needing a lot of year four uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never taught year four, you know, way back in my training, but I've not taught them since being a, a proper teacher. Um, so mm -hmm. I needed somewhere to get all that stuff from because I'm not, you know, not au okay fait with the curriculum really. Um, and our last year, I think I had to teach mainly year four objectives before I think I had the last couple of months of the year on year five objectives because they had missed so much. And there's no way I could just jump into year five without having done the foundations from the year before. Yeah, so that's that's the lesson to take away from ingredient two people. So we've so you've got that kind of really brilliant insight from Sophie about learning from those past papers. I'm sure you guys are scribbling some of those things down and you know now you need to go out, get yourselves like year three, year four, year five material, especially those early keystone concepts that they need to have before they move on. Going back to our pot of ingredients, this kind of leads on nicely to ingredient number three, which was easy, speedy gap analysis. Is it myth or magic? Do we believe that it is possible to do it? Sophie, we, we're looking at gaps now, but not all gaps are created equal, are they? No. Um, no, as, as all teachers know very well, learning gaps is, you know, bane of our lives. But um, I think if we think about a learning gap as a sort of subtraction here, so what children are expected to know, subtract what a pupil actually knows creates um, the learning gap. And um, I'm not sure, Daryl, are we looking at the percentages 
uh, for the next bit, or am I talking through the types of gaps? Oh, there we go, <laughs> like magic. Um, so the percentages here, um, if we look at how many children met the expected standard in the different subjects in SATs this year, um, reading had gone up by 1%, but all of the other subjects had decreased. So in maths, um, the amount of children passing the SATs or reaching expected standard had decreased by 8%, in writing by 9%, um, the combined by 6%, and the GP um, grammar punctuation and spelling by 6%. Um, and you know, we know COVID would have had a huge impact. And as we said before, these papers were written to be uh, delivered prior to COVID. So the fact that they are the same papers, the children have had however many months off of learning, you can see clearly here the impact that that has had on them. Yeah. And I think we can think about um, learning gaps, uh, sort of splitting them into two categories. So we have group learning gaps, which are a little bit easier to address. And that is just where an entire cohort of children have missed out on a certain topic because of a chunk of time out of school. So that is applicable to all children um, across the nation because of COVID, they've all missed out on huge chunks of learning topics, which are easier to cover in terms of delivery because you know everyone's missed them. So you can just plan that unit in elsewhere. Um, obviously there's the time pressure of if I've got to put that unit there, when am I gonna fit in the next unit? But they're a bit easier to, uh, to address. But then we have the individual learning gaps, which have always been around pre-COVID. Um, and that's just when a, an individual child has missed out on a topic, perhaps, or just an objective, perhaps due to um, an absence for a day or a couple of days. And we all know how irritating it is when you start a brand new topic um, in English or in maths and a child misses the first lesson and, and then they're a whole lesson behind. You think, oh, when are they going to catch up? Because the next lesson depends on them having learned what you've taught in that first lesson. Um, so they are, we're probably a bit more confident with addressing those because that's always been the case. Whereas the huge learning gaps we've got because of COVID is a bit trickier to address. Um, but um, I see quite a few ways of addressing these. I think firstly, by um, just your general formative assessment that teachers are really good at. And, um, we all do all the time in our lessons just to find out what the children already know and what they don't know. Obviously by speaking to the children's previous teacher, doing any sort of assessments that you might do at the beginning of the year and seeing where those gaps are um, and things I have the thing I have found particularly useful is learning by questions for this um, because let's say I'm about to do a fractions unit in year five I might take the fractions unit from year four on LBQ and just literally well I say black and white it's actually red red yellow and green in front of your yeah. face you can see exactly where the gaps are for which children it couldn't be clearer um and it takes seconds whereas you know going through all the papers that you might do it takes much much longer yeah what we're seeing there on the screen guys is kind of a recording of what you as a teacher see when you run a learning by questions question set so say you take a question set on a curriculum objective like fractions I Sophie just said and then you can see the children logging in and you can see how they're answering so you can see individual questions that the, the class might be struggling with or individual pupils John you ran the springboard last year how much time do you think it saved your teacher being able to run the gap analysis like this well you can see you can see on the screen how instant that that analysis is it comes up straight away um, and when I think about the time that it used to take me to out papers and other resources, administer tests or quizzes, mark them, codify those answers, creating spreadsheets, yeah, size those gaps. Um, I would say hours upon hours upon hours of time being saved. And that's time that you can either plow back into your lesson planning or plow back into time spent with specific pupils, or maybe even guys have an evening to yourself or finish a cup of coffee or, you know, get your mental health so that you are the best possible version of yourself when you're back in the classroom the next day. John, ingredient number four is going to be targeted revision. Now we know where the gaps are. We know exactly what we want to be revising. And also, I think this feeds in quite nicely into ingredient five, which is assessment without anxiety and engaging our reluctant learners. And I don't think there's a better place for us to find out how that works in actuality than, than, to, than for you to take us into Brown Hills West last year and tell us the story of what happened there. Yeah, so um, we introduced the springboard um, in January last year um, and we took, we took that on and we saw impact straight away and that was in terms of just the engagement, the children, there was a real buzz within the classroom. Anytime we let the children know that we were gonna be uh, doing complete some activities on learning by question um, 
And for me, it was like having a, a full class set of um, high quality textbooks with very intelligently design, designed questions that, like you said, Heather, came with its own built-in teacher with that feedback. Um, so the children were engaged, they were far more productive, um, especially within math lessons, actually. They were completing two and three times as many questions um, in the same time as it would say if they were working from um, a sheet or a, te or a textbook. Um, and obviously this led to absolutely fantastic progress. Um, so I think the interesting thing though about us was that the story of this cohort, um, particularly because when they returned post pandemic in year five, um, they found it so tricky as a class, they found it so tricky to, to settle back into school life. Um, and we had to put a lot of sort of support in for their social and emotional needs. And when we think about, we knew SATS was on the horizon, the SATS was coming back, and you think about all the gaps that the children have had within their learning. Um, obviously, we wanted to close the gap as quickly as we could, but the children weren't in the right place to learn for those yeah. first. And I think a lot of people feel like that school. behaviour has been a major thing, hasn't it, for everybody since we've come back. So you won't mm. be alone there. No, not at all. I'm sure lots of you have been in the same boat. And we had such a number of children who were completely disengaged, not wanting to take part in lessons. Um, the behaviours that we hadn't seen within children previously, um, I had to, on a daily basis, go out onto the estate and pick children up from school because they just lost faith. They didn't want to be in school. Their confidence had completely gone. Their self-esteem was rock bottom. Um, and this was when they were in year five. And then if we fast forward 12 months, um, you'd think they were a different, completely different class. Um, we introduced learning by question. They, we did put a lot of support in. They were in a much better place. But in terms of the engagement in their learning after introducing LBQ, it absolutely rocketed. Um, so you we guys were holding like breakfast clubs and things. Yeah, so we offered a breakfast club. We didn't. We were going to target children, but we didn't need to. We offered this breakfast club and we're saying in the morning you, you can come in if you want to from eight a.m. and during that time we're going to run some sessions on learning by question. Um, on the first day, I popped in to see um, Mr. Briley, our year six teacher. I pop, popped in to see him, and the whole class was full. Every single child was there, and that carried on. I think there was only actually two children that couldn't make the morning sessions, but they really wanted to. Every child made those morning sessions, and we had a full house every day. And I think the magic with that was that the children were able to see their progress day by day. Um, That's the confidence build. I mean, someone's yeah. just messaged there in the chat. Going, How do we build this low self-esteem? Yeah. And that's something that I think uh, over the years from when I was been in, the, uh, been in a year six teacher, it takes a lot of that one-to-one -one support and a lot of that feedback and encouragement. Um, and the children need to feel success. They need to feel that success early on in order to feel confident, to feel motivated. And what we found with the children coming in and using Learning by Question in the mornings, they were feeling success straight away, even before mm. they started. And what that was doing, it was setting them up for the day. And we just found that the children were so motivated, so engaged, um, they were feeling that success. Um, and their metacognition was developing as a byproduct of that um, because we just really wanted to get these children ready for year seven or that. Yeah. Um, and learning by question played such a massive part of helping those children to develop those skills. It's kind of learning to learn, isn't it? That's it yeah. going, back, going back and having another go, and that's really important. Because I think about my daughter, when she was doing her year six SATs, you know, she might do a past paper, but that teacher and daddy have spent the evening photocopying and then marking, just to discover that maybe she had a misconception early on and she got loads of it wrong. And then her confidence has gone down and down and down as opposed to building on it, which you could do with learning by questions, I guess. Yeah. I can see a question there. So someone's asked if when did the start, when did we start the breakfast club? We actually produced learning by question in January and we started the breakfast club then. Um, and when SATs finished, the children asked, could they still come into school? Could they still come in the mornings and, and go on to LBQ and practice the question sets? Because they knew the questions that they found hard and therefore they wanted to practice those. They wanted to get better at them. And that is that intrinsic motivation, isn't it? Um, and that's very difficult to to build within children um, but this certainly helped um, yeah and it's not built on gimmicks either it's not like 
they're coming in because they're going to get to do up an avatar or something. It's kind of like the motivation is seeing their own progress. Yeah, that's it. And I think if people stand a bit later on and have a look at the um, um, an activity yeah. in action, you'll see you'll see what the children see. They'll feel it. They'll feel yeah, it. You'll feel so, it. Yeah. So you were saying so January started. So take us through the results. What happened? What you know the bottom line? How did they get on? You started so, in January. We started in January. So our autumn, and I'm going to talk about maths because we found the biggest impact impact was within maths. Um, so. Our first data drop in autumn, just before Christmas, um, in maths, we had 40% of children that were on track to achieve age-related. And that was reflect that was a really true reflection as to where the children were with all those gaps that they had in the learning, plus all that time that we spent confidence building within year five and not trying to cram and do too much too fast. Um, introduced springboard, learning by question. And by March, that climbed to 64% of children that were on track to achieve age-related. Wow, in three months, you've gone from 40% to 60%. Yeah. And at that point, we, we all got together and we thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. The, the children have done so well. We were so, so proud. Um, and then fast forward again to May, um, we had 84% of children at age-related in maths and then 20% at greater depth. And I think, you know, I always say the proof is in the pudding. Those results speak for themselves. I'm not saying there wasn't also obviously lots of fantastic cheap teaching and lots of support in there, but LBQ, it just had that impact straight away. Yeah. And maths teacher did say that he, he was just, he just wished he discovered it sooner. He'd been teaching for eight and a half years. And he said, like it was, it was a game changer. And he had been in year six for, for many, many years. I completely understand. I saw it in action. So it was just... Um, it's just going to amplify. It's going to turn a, a great teacher. It's going to turn a good teacher into great teacher. It's just going to amplify what you're already doing in the lesson. It's like it's like any tool, isn't it? Any tool that, that you use as a teacher. Um, not only does this tool completely engage the children in the classroom, but also for the teacher as well. It means that they can spend their time working with the children and practice, you know, thinking about the delivery of those lessons rather than spending so much time on preparing resources marking assessments, working late into the evening, um, that the teachers were completely present, completely present for the children, and that had a huge impact too. And, and that's, that's exactly what we want. And this, the story you tell there, John, it's kind of music to our ears. It's why we get out of bed in the morning. It's why you guys get out of bed in the morning. Is that just knowing that, that satisfaction you must feel about knowing what you and your teachers have been able to do for that cohort. And that, that group of kids, their lives have kind of changed now because they believe that they can do it and that school is for them, which is quite incredible. Um, now, I know that you guys will have lots more questions for John, and we do actually send out, uh, with the slides for this and the recording, a, a greater case study where we actually meet some of the staff at John's school and you find out a little bit more about how that went. Um, so you'll get all of that as well, people. But we must move on to ingredient number six, which is to sprinkle on, and we always love the sprinkles, that stretch and challenge. Now, I'm feeling pretty limber. Uh, so I am ready for a little bit of a stretch here, Daryl. Um, why don't you walk us through how we do stretch and challenge here at Learning by Questions? And I reckon that out there in our audience, there are lots of different people of different abilities and they want to know, how are we going to cater for all of them? Thanks, Heather. Yeah, so um, we've most of LBQ's question sets are mastery question sets, so they progress in difficulty. So I'm going to take you through um, a maths one today, but it's a similar story for English or primary science as well. So level one of our maths mastery sets contains recaps of important prior knowledge or pictorial representations. So it kind of um, makes sure that the children get up, off to a successful start and they've got all the important um, understanding in place to be successful. When they've answered enough questions automatically, uh, correctly, sorry, they will progress automatically onto level two. Level two contains our fluency questions where the pupils tackle these questions independently. Normally they are the, the lesson objective, the curriculum objective. And then later in that level, they progress to some simple contextual application of that skill. Again, when they've answered enough of those questions correctly, they progress to level three, which contains five quality reasoning questions to really get the children thinking. There are some beautiful open-ended questions in this level. Some of my absolute favourites are in there. 
you can pull the people's responses up on your whiteboard at the front of class, have some great discussions and promote some deep mathematical thinking. And finally, in level four, uh, we have problem solving where pupils answer two step problems linked to other areas of maths. And then eventually they progress to some real greater depth questions that will, I guarantee, challenge you even uh, the quickest learners in your class. Oh, they're pretty tricky. They are you've been <laughs> really tricky with those ones, Daryl, but everybody loves some good problem solving questions. So that's great. Yeah. So it's so you can see that the way we've designed our question sets that. Uh, pupils will progress to the to the right level of challenge and they will make sure that um, they've understood as they've been going along as well. So that's been a one minute taster really of, of the, the kind of content that we have um, and that the pupils enjoyed using uh, as John was talking about earlier. So now we'd like to give you the chance to experience them for yourselves as a pupil would. So a bit of a, a practical part of the session now. So this is where everybody get your other, your other window open, get your other device, open another window. If you open another window to so take part in this, don't forget your little Zoom link is like a little camera icon back at the bottom so you can find us. And if you are watching the recording of this webinar, then don't worry, you can also take part. You won't be able to use the codes that Daryl's just about to give out, but you will be able to go on our website, lbq.org forward slash sats. And then we have embedded the pupil experience into that page. Uh, I think we've got a SATS revision page it, paper in there and you can have a go too, but we're gonna do it live now with everybody at home. Okay, thanks. So um, to join an LBQ task, we, we try to avoid having big, um, big lists of usernames and passwords that are very complicated. We've tried to make it as easy as possible and not, put, not make any barriers um, to using EdTech in the classroom. So um, to join a to join a task, lbq.org slash task. My colleague will be posting some direct links in the chat in a moment, uh, and then input the code of your choice. So today we've got four different sessions running, depending on what you'd like to have a look at. We've got White Rose Maths block reviews for years three, four, and five. Uh, choose the code CMMZ for that one. Poetry and GPS sat sets and a mastery GPS set are on the code HCDZ and a math sats paper and a mastery paper, a mastery question set, sorry, will be on ZMKY and reasoning and problem solving is on KKCM. So just go through that again. There are some direct links in the chat which will open up a new window for you automatically if you click on those. Um, or you can type in lbq.org slash task and then put in the four characters, whichever you'd like to have a look at. So I'm going to leave that on the screen. There's a smorgasbord there, Daryl, of things that people can have a go at, isn't there? There's, uh, you know, if you're fancying a little bit of poetry, Sophie mentioned poetry earlier, why don't you jump onto HCDZ? That's how fast it is. No usernames, no passwords, no complications. You know, you jump on there. We can already see that people are logging into those and having a go at the questions. I think you're going to find them quite addictive. Absolutely. So um, carry on answering questions for a couple of minutes. Don't forget to get some wrong. I'm just going to nip off and have a look at the teacher screen to see, see who's joined us. So I see we've got, got lots of people have gone straight away. Maybe this was predictable for, for a maths set three paper one. But I think you might have got them paused, Daryl. So I think, I don't know if, I don't know if the oh. uh, maths people can get going. Oh. That's the brilliant thing is that the teacher can control it. You know, you've ever had that thing where you want all eyes on me and they're busy, busy, busy away. Well, this is, you can pause a question set, can't you, John? And people can, you know, then the pupils can completely focus on you. But oh my gosh, look at them coming through now, Daryl, answering the questions. Absolutely. So we've got, uh, I can see every, everyone's made a fantastic start over on the Maths Sats paper. Um, SD has made a little mistake on question two. Hopefully they'll read the feedback. It was but, deliberate, wasn't it, SD? You yeah, meant to make I hope that, so. just to see what the feedback was going to be like. Yep. So SD, I can see, has now had two attempts at that. Plenty of people getting question two wrong. So that's on, on the SATS paper. You can have up to three tasks running at the same time. So I'm now just going to pop back and have a look at the calculate percentages of amounts. Well, we've got some high and achievers the names here, there. haven't we? Yeah, so see, uh, see Lizzie's doing really well. She's getting all the questions right. She's racing through it. Oh, spoke too <laughs> soon. She's just got question five wrong. 
hopefully the feedback will help on that one. Uh, there aren't so any limits, are there, Daryl, to how many people can work, how many children can be working in an activity. And the fact that you can have those three activities running at the same time means you can, you can do that adaptive teaching thing. You can give people slightly different things to be focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you can, uh, and you can dip back as well into early year groups. Um, you can use so, some extra challenge sets. I've got some additional challenge sets. You can set those as well. Um, so that's great. We've got lots, lots of people that have joined and happily answering the questions. We've even got a KP, JL and Lizzie have jumped up onto the fluency questions because they've done really well. Um, so what I'm going to do now at this point is I'm just going to pause everybody. So maybe I've spotted something going on on the results matrix. So if you if uh, you can still see the screen, that's great. If not, you can you can just listen. Um, so I'm having a look here at the, at the SATS paper, and I've noticed that question two has caused quite a few problems for for a lot of people in this in this group. So I've paused it. I'm going to do a mini plenary. I'm going to pull the question up. It's a little bit slow because we've got uh, we've got hundreds of people in this one. But um, it is instant we, with just a normal class size. So I might do some extra modeling on there. I might explore some misconceptions. I might highlight key information that the children might have missed, all those common mistakes that you see all the time. So you can do a little mini plenary, get rid of any misconceptions straight away. And you can even send that question with your annotations back to everyone that's connected. So if you're, if you're in that task now, if you're on task two, you should see that question coming back to you so you can have another go. And on the left hand side of my screen, I'll be able to check that everyone is OK with that. Uh, so I can see, show the names here. So Mrs. T, unfortunately, she still got it wrong, even after all my excellent teaching and Amelia is still struggling. So I might say, OK, Mrs. T and Amelia, you could come and let's uh, go through this again uh, while the rest of the class get on. So you can see how it's all about using the live information to, to make the most of every moment. Yeah, this isn't about babysitting kids on iPads, is it? This is really about being able to create more of those interactive moments between the teacher and the pupil and making those as impactful as they possibly can be. Yeah. This is looking fantastic. Thank you very much for everybody taking part on that. That's brilliant. We're, we're coming towards the end. So what I want to do now, Daryl, is just kind of go over uh, what our key ingredients have been for our SAT success. So if you remember everybody, ingredient one was make a plan, put it down on paper, not in your head. You're gonna do things differently this year. You're not going to drown under piles of paperwork um, and marking into the night and getting those spreadsheets out to do that question level analysis and standing in the photocopying queue. No more. We're not doing that anymore. We're going to make a better plan. Ingredient two, we had all those lovely insights from Sophie. What can we learn from them so that we're working smarter, not harder? Ingredient number three, gap analysis. It doesn't need to take you all night and you can do it continuously so you know who you need to teach, when you need to teach them, what you need to teach them. Ingredient four and ingredient five, that amazing story from John about that targeted revision. It wasn't just what the teacher wanted to target as well, but also what the pupils started to know they needed to work on. And ingredient five, and I think this is really, really, really um, key, is, uh, you know, assessment without anxiety. Kids can enjoy doing this. You guys enjoyed, I can see you rattling through those questions there. It can be a lot of fun, can't it? you know, testing ourselves and seeing the progress that we're making. And then finally, I think you're all feeling it. You'll certainly feel it tomorrow. We've sprinkled on that extra stretch and challenge so that everybody in your class, and how satisfying will it be for you to know that everybody in your class has been working at level of pace and challenge for them and staying in the class. Uh, for work of moments for you to pick the right question set. So they're all the elements that you wanted to put into our crock pot of SATS success. Now, if you want to take part in this, the SAT springboard, all you do is you go to the website that's there, lbq.org forward slash SATs. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll see the, you'll see the web page. you'll see videos of other people who've taken the SAT springboard and how they've got on. And then you book a little date and time with us. It's just enough time to have a cup of tea. But what we'll do in that is we'll learn a little bit about you and your school, and we will provide you with extra licenses. 
So it doesn't just have to be for you. If there's three members of your staff teaching your year group or even your entire key stage, we'll provide free licenses for at least half a term. So you have all the resources, which I said are free all the rest of the time, but you'll also for half a term have this continuous formative assessment as you go. Imagine guys on the other side of Christmas, how much time that's gonna save you and what a difference, what an impact you're gonna be able to make in January at the beginning of the year. So Sophie, why do you think this is a good idea to utilize this in the next you know, few months? Um, I just think really to get your head around, um, firstly, different curricula. So if you're an expert in year six, which I'm sure everyone is, then knowing where the gaps are in year three, four and five are useful and what the curriculum content looks like. Um, I think that's probably the most useful thing, like you said, rather than scouring the internet for all different types of resources for year three maths or year four grammar, it's all there for you. Yeah, absolutely. You can dip down, you, you know, you could pivot, you could you could set a year four piece of material and then find, I'm sure I'm looking at my matrix and I can see this is a bit hard. I'm going to go back and get the year three version and you can do it like that. You don't need to get back in the photocopying queue. John, you used this last year. Would you ever go back to doing things how they used to be? No, I wouldn't. Um, I think for all of the reasons that Sophie talked about, but one thing that I think we haven't mentioned an awful lot is the impact it has on the teacher's workload and their well-being is it's massive and you know this tool could could help with a lot of issues that we currently have in terms of workload teacher attention things like that so i think it's so yeah. there's been a lot in the news this week haven't they it's an absolute travesty we just think we're losing so many beautiful wonderful talented teachers out there and this could really really help you and and you know i've seen such you know year six teachers getting incredibly stressed this does not need to be you guys this year. Um, right, okay, so the webinar is over. I want to thank Sophie so much. Now, Sophie will be staying with us throughout the springboard. She's writing us some blogs. She's passing on some more top tips. So get on that springboard so that you can hear more from Sophie. John and the children at Brown Health, what an amazing, amazing achievement this last year. We know that this is perfect for really brilliant teachers. And I just, you know, I, I look forward to hearing how your, how this year's cohort is getting on. Thank you so much to Daryl and our team behind the scenes. They have been answering all the questions. 